Welcome to With One Accord, the Houston Chamber Choir podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn, host of Behind the Music. This episode is provided in part thanks to the generosity of Silvercrest Asset Management Group, celebrating its 20th year in business, providing bespoke investment solutions. Today, my guest is organist Daryl Robinson. Daryl, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Let's start by talking about how you have been associated with the Houston Chamber Choir over the years. Yeah, my association with the Chamber Choir probably goes back nearly a decade at this point. Um, I, when I was organist for, oh, 15 or so years at South Main Baptist in Midtown, uh, Houston Chamber Choir was doing their Here Are the Future concerts there, which I still believe they're uh, holding at South Main. And uh, Bob Simpson was gracious enough to invite me to perform uh, on those concerts uh, every year. And so I did. And then uh, in about uh, 2014, I joined the staff as the accompanist after uh, Bruce Power had uh, retired from Christ Church and from the Chamber Choir and um, worked there until 2015 when I joined the faculty at Westminster Choir College up in Princeton. Um, so this will actually be my first performance with the Houston Chamber Choir since moving back to Houston in 2017. So what have you performed with them in concert? Yeah, during uh, my time, we, I've, I've done the Christmas at the Villa performances a few times over at the Villa de Mattel. Um, and uh, any number of concerts, I, I've played with them out at Miller Outdoor Theater. We did a Beatles concert. I think it was Beatles and Brahms out at Miller Outdoor Theater. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and then uh, various other uh, concerts um, uh, around the city. So, You, I believe, became the organist at South Main Baptist Church in Houston at the tender age of 16. Is that correct? Uh, 19. Very close. 19. 19. 19. Yeah. Uh, still, still young. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh, was 2003 when I, I joined the staff at South Main and uh, ended up being there uh, really on staff uh, until 2015. You left, as you said, to, uh, to move to Princeton to the Westminster Choir College. And uh, you taught on the, uh, the faculty there. And then you came back to Houston. And you're now assistant professor and director of organ studies at the Moore School of Music at the University of Houston, which I believe is also your alma mater. It is indeed. I did my undergraduate studies here at U of H uh, as a student of Robert Bates. Uh, and then uh, took a, a year off um, that I was doing some private coaching and then uh, did a master's degree uh, as part of uh, Ken Cowan's first class over at Rice University. So you are now back in Houston. Where were you born? I'm a native Houstonian. There are a few of us around. I grew up in Pasadena, south of the city, uh, but went to high school at HSBBA. I was a double bass major. Uh, they didn't need a pianist, but they said, oh, we have a spot for a double basses. And I was playing in middle high school and uh, junior high. And so I figured, hey, why not? And uh, so I, I've sort of have been in the downtown, midtown Montrose area for as long as I can remember. And for those that don't know, HSPVA is the high school for the performing and visual arts. So y you started out then, it sounds like, as a double bassist. How did you become an organist? Well, I was always fascinated. Uh, HSPBA unfortunately did not and still does not have an organ program. Uh, so I started organ when I was about oh, 13 or so years old. Um, and so I, I came to the organ pretty early uh, in life and had studied piano before that, of course, as most folks do. Um, and then uh, I was also in the Houston Boy Choir. And so I've always done a mix of things. I've never sort of viewed myself as just an organist. I've done uh, a lot of piano study, harpsichord, choral conducting, and then, of course, orchestral work uh, all the way through high school anyway. I've always thought of the organ as um, an unusual choice. It's not the sort of instrument that you can have in your home. I mean, some people may be, but you know, generally speaking, it's not like a, a piano or a violin. Or So how did you first sort of get your hands on an organ? Yeah, I, I grew up at a church in Pasadena that had a, uh, an organ. I, I have to confess, when I was a junior high student, I, I transferred church membership, not for the most noble of reasons, but the church I grew up in had an electronic organ, and then I switched to a church that had a pipe organ, mainly because they had a pipe organ. 
And they, to be fair, they also had an active youth choir program and some other things that were appealing to me at that point. But it was really the, the access to the pipe organ at that point that really hooked me. What is the difference, the essential difference between an electronic organ and a pipe organ? Sure. So an electronic organ really depends upon a pipe organ in that all it is, is is reproducing recorded sound of a pipe organ at this point. So it's it's they've gone through and recorded every pipe. A pipe organ is a windblown instrument that basically still functions as it did all the way back in the time of the Greeks. Um, the fundamental concept has really remained the same, which is basically a, a, a set of pipes sitting atop a, a pressurized box of air. And that fundamental pro, um, idea is still used in every pipe organ. Uh, of course, now, thankfully, we have electricity, uh, so we don't have to manually pump or have water pumping the bellows. Uh, so certainly things have advanced. But uh, the pipe organ is a very historic and um, important instrument in the development of the musical world. And I should point out that you are sitting in front of a pipe organ in your office at the Moore School of Music at, at the University of Houston. I am indeed. This is a, a beautiful instrument uh, that actually was in someone's home in Pasadena, California. Uh, Richard Kirtland is, is his name, uh, and he graciously donated this instrument to the Moore School um, last year. And uh, we just acquired it um, really in August of, of this year. Thanks to the pandemic, things, uh, of course, got a bit delayed, like everything else. Uh, but this is a mechanical action pipe organ. And so you see the keyboard and the pipes right behind me. And then over this shoulder, there's a box here that has the blower, an electric blower in it to generate the air for the, the organ. So you started to play the organ, tinker about on the organ um, at your church. At what point did you take it up seriously, if you like, and began to actually study uh, the uh, organ performance? Yeah, I think um, really it was... It, it, for me, the organ has always been, first and foremost, an instrument for church music. And so church music has been such a big part of my life um, as a teenager and then going on to my life at South Main. And really through my development at South Main is when I really decided that this was a, a career path and a, a profession that I was really um, interested in and turned out to be good at, thankfully. Um, and so that that's really been my, my journey is through church music first and not so much organ performance. That's always one of the tricky things that we do is that we organists have to be trained a bit differently than other musicians because we have to be collaborative musicians much more than we do solo artists usually. And when you say collaborative, you mean, for example, performing with a choir. Precisely. And of yeah. course, historically, the interconnection between organ and voice is, is uh, I mean, it's, it's, um, one of the most important combinations, I think, in music literature, and certainly um, in the sacred context, organ either accompanying congregational singing or choral or solo singing um, is a huge part of the repertoire. I believe that you were actually, after your undergraduate degree, you were actually contemplating changing directions somewhat and going into, into choral conducting. What, what stopped you? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's funny. You always have those things that happen in your life. And, and I think everybody, uh, you often have a vision for what you want your life and your career to look like. And, and sometimes you take a different path and then eventually you realize that was the right path. Uh, for me, after I graduated, I entered, entered the um, American Guild of Organists National Young Artist Competition in Organ Performance, shorthand NIACOP. And um, it's really yeah. the preeminent American competition for organ playing. Um, and so after graduating, I was coaching with David Higgs up at the Eastman School, commuting back and forth quite a bit uh, to do some coaching with him and entered the competition uh, and thankfully ended up going through semifinals and then the finals and ended up winning the competition. And that was really the deciding factor for, OK, this is clearly the, the direction my career is going. And it doesn't mean that I won't do choral conducting, but that helps sort of solidify in your mind perhaps a direction your career might take. That was 2012, I think. Indeed. Hard to believe uh, next year would be 10 years since that. But yes, indeed. What is it that you love about the organ? And I should say that unlike a piano, pianos are, tend to be all the same. They may have a, they may have a different timbre, a, a different sound. 
but they they're all essentially the same they've got 88 keys and what have you but organs can vary widely can't they absolutely uh you know the instrument seated behind me here is uh has about 12 sets of pipes on it so 12 sort of sounds that you could create with it uh, an instrument like Christchurch Cathedral, where the uh, candlelight Christmas concerts will be held, has about um, oh, 70, I think, sets of pipes. And so where this organ has a few hundred pipes on it, that organ has, I believe, close to 4,000 pipes on it. And so the wow. varying degree of color that you can make on an instrument of that size is really thrilling. And I think for me, um, again, with sort of an orchestral background, the idea that you can recreate symphonic effects on a large pipe organ that's designed to do that is fantastic. Um, or an instrument like this where you really can be very delicate and focus more on early music and um, kind of controlling your technique. These are uh, practice instruments are really valuable for training uh, organists uh, to be really aware of what they're doing. And I should say that you are the organist at Christchurch Cathedral in downtown Houston, aren't you? Indeed. What's that? You've mentioned the size of the organ. What's that space like for you as an organist? Yeah, it's a really beautiful space. Um, of course, it's it's for anyone that's been in the room, they'll immediately notice the uh, uh, woodworking that's all over the, the space. And of course, the beautiful stained glass and the rood screen. Uh, the organ is situated over on the left side of the building. And then there are some sets of pipes in the back. Um, and all I can say is I promise I'll use nearly everything at the candlelight Christmas concert. So the, you'll get to hear the full dynamic range from really the very softest um, sounds that the organ can make to absolutely the most uh, tutti sort of ferocious sounds that the instrument can make. I know for professional keyboard players uh, involved in performance, when you travel around, um, I mean, even you know, concert pianists, when they arrive at a, a new venue to perform with an orchestra, for example, they have to uh, acclimate themselves to the pianos that are on offer by the, the symphony orchestra or the hall. Um, and the same is true for organs as well. What do you have to do to prepare for a recital? Let's say you were, well, I know, I know for example, that You've played, in fact, you've recorded on the organ at Walt Disney Hall in Los Angeles. How do you approach getting ready for a recital? Yeah, the first step really is to receive what we call the specifications of the organ. And that details for us what stops are on every single keyboard and on the pedal board. Um, so then we have an idea of what the instrument is at least capable of doing. Um, when I arrive at a venue to play a recital, uh, usually um, I, I spend three nights uh, when I go out on the road to play a, a recital. Uh, the first two days are spent practicing and setting uh, registrations is the first thing. So it takes about 12 to 15 hours with every organ. So it, it's really, uh, you can't quite just hop off and, and spend a few minutes with it. Uh, you have to go through and program your whole recital. And that is to say, when, if you look at an organ, you see all those stops. We have to set all of those to coordinating buttons uh, called pistons so that we can really recall um, set sounds for a specific piece of repertoire. And the stops are the, uh, are the, um, the pulls that, that come out right. either yeah. side of the keyboard. Exactly, and every stop has a, a name on it. So it tells you what it does. So it would say like a uh, flute or a principal or a trumpet or a clarinet or whatever that may be, or some mechanical uh, feature that is to say that you can take sound from one keyboard and move it to another keyboard, and then you can put all those sounds together. So it is very much like a synthesizer in this kind of layering of sound that you can do. And what we do is we spend a lot of time just setting and getting used to the coordination. A lot of times uh, organs, uh, the, the, the buttons, the pistons that we have to push are not always in the same place. So some of it is relearning choreography. For organists, we can't, it's not enough to just learn our notes. We then have to learn how to make the music actually come to life at the organ uh, through all of these expressive aids. So sometimes you get you have to rework your choreography after you've spent time setting up all your pistons and figuring out the way the right way uh, to make the organ sound its absolute best. And the added complication, of course, are the foot pedals. Right. Yeah, it is how uh, many? 
there are generally 32 uh, keys down for the pedal um, for the feet, and the manuals have 61. So the compass is a bit different than a, a, a modern piano with 88 keys. Um, so the, the, the manual compass is 61, and the feet have 32 notes that we can play down there. And there are special, I understand, organ shoes, organ slippers. <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of pairs. I have some that uh, were made by a sort of specialized company called Organ Masters. But the general principle is that you have basically a, a dress shoe or a dance shoe uh, with soft leather on the bottom and a raised mm -hmm. heel. So as you're playing, you know, if you were just playing with your flat foot, it's very hard to move between notes. So by raising the heel, then you can move between notes uh, without or at least minimizing the number of mistakes one makes. I remember going to a recital given by Cameron Carpenter, and he was wearing some organ slippers covered in Swarovski crystals. Do you have anything like that? <laughs> I, I do not. Uh, I, I think the uh, my second pair are a pair of Latin dance shoes, uh, and those are they have an even more elevated heel than the, the regular organ shoes, which are helpful for virtuosic uh, sort of pedal pieces. Um, but they're kind of uncomfortable to wear around, so I don't I don't tend to use those much. But no, I don't have any rhinestones or anything, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> what about the keyboard, the manuals on an organ? How many are there, or does that is that something that can vary? That varies. Again, the organ right behind me has two keyboards. The organ that folks will see at Christchurch Cathedral has four keyboards. Um, and we, all the way up to seven and eight keyboards exist in the world. Uh, if you go somewhere like the Wanamaker Organ in Philadelphia or um, Atlantic City Convention Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, those instruments have seven and eight keyboards. Very wild, huge, opulent sort of designs. Is there a difference between an organ that you might encounter in a cathedral or in a church and the sort of instruments that you've just mentioned, the, uh, a Wanamaker, for example, in a, in a, a movie theater or a, a convention space, which is not going to be used primarily for sacred music. Right, yeah, the instruments can vary quite a bit. I mean, the, the Wanamaker organ in particular is really noted for sort of having symphonic uh, color. So you can play, you know, Mahler symphonies on the organ and sound very convincing. You can do Wagner transcriptions and all of these sorts of things. Um, and that all came out of sort of the teens and 20s um, in a bit of um, when or organ orchestration was very popular. And in fact, many times choirs, when they would perform, they wouldn't always have access to a full symphony orchestra, of course. And so many times mm -hmm. organists were expected to transcribe something like Handel's Messiah or the Mozart Requiem and make that work at the organ. And so the instruments sort of developed to, uh, to fill that need in England and then in the United States. And then of course, in the teens, 20s and 30s, you had uh, the theater organ, which were very popular in all sorts of movie houses and things uh, to accompany silent film. Let's talk about some of your recordings because you, uh, at a young age, have started to, uh, to produce commercial recordings. And the latest, your latest, is titled A Love So Fierce, the complete solo organ works of David Ashley White, who is the past director of the Moore School of Music at the University of Houston. Talk a little bit about that CD and the, the works that David has written for your instrument. Right. Uh, well, I've known David for many years. I met him as an undergraduate student here at U of H and started performing some of his music, uh, both as an organist and um, as the accompanist for a concert chorale here at the University of Houston. So I was doing a lot of uh, collaborative work through my undergrad and working with David, uh, both for choral and organ. Um, and when uh, David and I have chatted at various times off and on about recording the complete organ works in one place, he's had a lot of his music, of course, recorded uh, by various ensembles and organists and choirs all over the world. Um, but to have everything in one place uh, seemed like a nice goal. And so uh, it turned out also that the organ at Christchurch Cathedral had never had a commercial disc. And so this recording is actually the first commercial recording of the cathedral organ. Um, and so it seemed appropriate uh, as a native Houstonian to record music of David White, one of our most prolific uh, Houston-based composers at Christchurch. And David, of course, being a good uh, Episcopal uh, 
member himself, uh, to be a member of the Episcopal Church, um, uh, seemed all the more appropriate. But the, the disc is full of a really diverse collection of music um, based on some of David's original hymn tunes. Uh, and we included uh, two works for organ and oboe. David was by training an oboist. Uh, and the brilliant Grace Tice here in Houston recorded those two works with me there. And then we have a couple of tracks uh, that are based on hymn tunes written for members of the cathedral community. Uh, the first being Bob Simpson. Uh, so the hymn tune Simpson is, is named for Bob. And then Prophet, uh, named for John Prophet, who's a member of the cathedral choir as well. That's an interesting point, actually, that when you do a recording, you're you're putting yourself out there, you're showcasing your talent, but you're also demonstrating the organ. And I know that, that within the, uh, the, the world of organists, the American Guild of, of Organists, for example, there is uh, a great deal of, of, of discussion and study and contemplation about different organs, and, and they, they have different reputations, don't they? Absolutely. Uh, so one of my goals has, has been to do recordings on instruments that have not been overly recorded. So uh, the first commercial recording of Christchurch Cathedral, for example, that organ was built in 1938. So it's a very historic instrument and very important, built by Aeolian Skinner, which is probably the most important and famous American organ building firm. Uh, and the recording, as you mentioned, at Walt Disney Concert Hall uh, was the first commercial recording of that instrument. Uh, built by Manuel Rosales and uh, Gaspar Glattergotz from Germany. And um, my first commercial disc was at Rice University, um, the beautiful Fisk Rosales organ there. And um, so I, I've tried to seek out venues that have not had a lot of commercial disc stuff. Another aspect of, of organs is that I know when they built the new co-cathedral, the Catholic uh, cathedral in Houston, the organ was part of the construction of the space. It wasn't something that was wheeled in afterwards. Does that make a difference? You know, you have a, a, an old building that, uh, you know, doesn't have an organ and they build one. Whereas in newer buildings, very often the organ is part of the, initial building of the of the space. Does that make a difference? Uh, it does make a difference. And I think there are pros and cons of both uh, approaches. The benefit of building an organ for an existing space is, of course, you can go in and actually experience the acoustic. I marvel at organ builders that can design an organ for a space that doesn't yet exist. You don't know exactly what the acoustic will sound mm -hmm. like, and you're trying to create an instrument that will match this space that doesn't exist. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's um, a great deal of art and um, science and, of course, a lot of good luck that goes into those sorts of uh, projects. Um, and the name of the builder, by the way, is Martin Pozzi, who actually built the organ that sits right here. Uh, so we have three Pozzi okay. organs here in Houston now. Uh, so I, I say he has a trinity here in uh, Houston, but Martin is a great guy and um, a fabulous builder. But yes, he built the organ at the Co Cathedral and really uh, built much of that organ on site to fit that space. But it is, it is a big challenge. Um, organs are not just musical instruments. They are really um, architectural uh, additions to any space that they go to. And, but they need to be appropriate to that space, don't they? Exactly. If you had, let's say, a mid-century modern building and you put an organ that looks like it's from, you know, the 18th century or 17th century in that space, it might look a bit odd. So you have to match um, the aesthetic um, of the room that you're building for. You also, of course, then have to match the acoustic. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in a really bright and light room to build an organ that perhaps is very romantic and somewhat heavy sounding might not be the right approach. You know, I think there's a lot of choices that go into that. And of course, at, at the end of the day, you have to build an organ that meets the needs of the musical community, whether that be a university or a movie theater or a concert hall or a church. I think one of the uh, most memorable experiences of, of my life was in the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris uh, back in the, uh, in the 1990s. And I was in Paris for Easter and went to mass in the cathedral on uh, Easter Sunday morning. And it was a big celebration. The Cardinal said mass, etc. 
And uh, at the end of Mass, as everybody was processing off the altar and up the center aisle, etc., the organist was playing, uh, you know, a, a voluntary or um, something to uh, as they processed out. And they'd got back into the sacristy and the organist carried on playing and it came to an end and he held that note. And then, you know, he, he took his his hands and his feet off the pedals. And that music, that note reverberated around that space for, it seemed like a, a minute. I mean, it was, it was the most, it was almost a spiritual experience. Absolutely. And it made you, made me realize that, that the organ um, brings so much to, or can bring so much to the expression of one's faith. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's no mistake, of course, that Mozart referred to the pipe organ as the king of instruments, uh, because it really is both in scale and the amount of um, volume that it can produce. Uh, but I should say that organs, um, when designed well, again, I think they have a big dynamic range. It's not just about making an organ that plays really loud, but an instrument that can also play really soft. Um, and so sometimes bigger organs are not always designed. I think a lot of times people assume they see a large pipe organ it might immediately be louder. That might be the case, but it also could have a lot more soft sounds on it as well. And so, um, but certainly in uh, many European cathedrals, the instruments are very large and have been added to over the centuries um, and have represented um, power and authority of both the church and the state. Um, like in France, for example, uh, many wonderful historic powerful organs uh, that were designed to really um, resonate and represent the power and the authority of the church and state, I think is, is um, remarkable sort of era of organ building in that time. Many of the uh, composers of organ music were sort of gravitated toward Paris and were organists at some of the, the magnificent churches in in Paris. I think of uh, César Franck, for example, or uh, Vidor. Right. That French Romantic school is really magical because in, in France in particular, the, the music and the instruments have always been very aligned. That is to say that very specific sounds and effects were um, either inspired by composition or the composers were inspired by the uh, musical effects that the organs could create. But certainly beginning with César Franck and an organ builder by the name of Aristide cavaille uh, the organ began to try to replicate the orchestral sounds possible. And of course, in that era of music, melody and accompaniment were really uh, sort of the, the main um, attraction for music and sort of the way music had developed, as opposed to the Baroque era, where, of course, many voices were all sort of had equal footing in polyphonic music. Um, then you, you, the organs needed to evolve to have the ability to create a more melodic line. Um, and they did that, it required quite a bit of mechanical advancement. And it required advancement of the key um, action itself. Uh, because if you keep adding two organs and you're building more wind, you then are pushing down on more pressure uh, to make all of that work. Uh -huh. And so mechanical assists uh, in France, uh, Kibaya Cole developed what's called the Barker machine, um, developed with an Englishman, Charles Barker. And that device helps take the weight off of the keyboards. And without that device, we would not have had all of the music of Vidor and Franck and Vierne and, and later Cochereau and all the wonderful people that came after in France. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Organs in the world that you are dying to get your hands on. Yeah, well, I, I, that's um, not a hard question for me because I actually I do have a favorite organ and that is the very first organ I ever played when I visited uh, Europe. It's um, down in Poitiers in France, um, Poitiers. built by a company uh, called Clicquot, and it is basically untouched from 1780 or 1790, somewhere in there. And so it wow. has been restored, but the organ is exactly the way it would have been in the 18th century. And the room, you talk about acoustic, that room, I think, uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 12 or 13 seconds of reverb, it's really one of the most magical spaces. Um, and as you go up to the organ, you're walking up, of course, little steps, and you realize all the indents in them and all the people that have walked up those steps before you to go play the organ and to serve and to lead in worship. 
uh, it's really, it's a humbling experience. But that organ is one of the most magical uh, sounds on the planet in that space. What about in some of these iconic churches? What, what the reputation of those organs? I mean, do organists sit at home and, and salivate over the prospect of playing the, the organ in Notre Dame or, or St. Paul's Cathedral or Westminster Abbey? Certainly, absolutely. And St. Thomas uh, Fifth Avenue in New York, or um, let's say the, the Catholic Cathedral out in Los Angeles. Uh, there are many, many fine pipe organs in churches um, and in our own city, of course, you mentioned the Co-Cathedral. Uh, there are new pipe organs at St. Martin's Episcopal Church, uh, South Main Baptist. Christ the King Lutheran has a recent organ. St. Philip Presbyterian has a beautiful pipe organ. Houston really has become a mecca for organ building in the last decade mm -hmm. or two. And it's not, the, the great thing is it's not just building organs in one style. If you go to Christ the King Lutheran, you can see a copy of a German Baroque organ. If you go to Rice University, you can see a copy of a Cavalli Cole organ. If you go to the Co Cathedral, you can see sort of a large eclectic pipe organ. So right here in our own city, we have a really great example of um, organ building from around the world, which as a university professor for teaching students is just one of the most invaluable aspects of why I love being in Houston. But the organ is not just an instrument for sacred music, is it? Not at all. Uh, plenty of uh, orchestral uh, music requires uh, an organ. And of course, as we've already mentioned uh, in popular culture, uh, a silent film accompaniment and all of that is really um, a very common. And orchestral transcriptions, again, I think uh, that's one of the great uh, features of the organ, the ability to take uh, a great symphonic score and to reduce it down and to make it work on a really um, excellent pipe organ is a great challenge and a great opportunity. Is that something that you have done yourself? Yes, I, I both as a performer and a teacher, I, I spend quite a bit of time orchestrating and uh, whether that's taking choral anthems and um, figuring out, let's say uh, it was originally for orchestra, transcribing the work and really thinking of what the orchestral instruments were and trying to replicate that on the organ. There, that's a, a great deal of time, uh, but it's one of the things that excites me the most about being a collaborative musician and an organist. And you have a, a CD of um, American uh, organ music, don't you? Yeah, the CD uh, from Disney Hall uh, is called American Fantasia and features all organ music uh, either composed in the, in the United States by Americans or by uh, foreigners who wrote the piece while traveling in America. Um, and I, I, gosh, I can't remember right off, I think six or seven of the tracks are pieces that I've commissioned uh, personally. And so that was a really important project for me to not only do the first commercial recording of this fantastic organ, but also to then feature uh, the world premiere recording of so much new music for the organ, uh, including a, a great piece, uh, certainly not sacred, called Rumba uh, for four Latin percussion instruments and organ. Do you play differently if you're playing sacred music, you're playing in a church, you're accompanying a choir, as opposed to uh, non-sacred music where you are probably a solo performer? Yeah, I, I think um, as a solo performer, of course, you can use generally more resources of the organ. Uh, when you're accompanying a choir, you have to be very careful to get the right color, but of course being mindful of balance and how it works with the ensemble. And that's really the, the trick of being a, a successful collaborative organist is that you've got to be able to get the right color and the right effect without overpowering the ensemble that you're accompanying. When you are in a, at a church organ, and you're accompanying a service and there is a, a conductor, a choir master. Um, is there a negotiation between the organist and the, the choir master ahead of time as to, as to what registrations to use? Or is that sort of left exclusively to the organist? At the end of a, of a hymn, for example, during rehearsal, you know, would the choir master come over and say, don't do that again? <laughs> choose, a, choose a different stops. Yeah, no, I think it really depends on uh, sort of the established rapport that any two musicians have together. And, um, you know, the more collaborative people can work together, uh, the better things are always. And um, so I think uh, we're, we're fortunate, for example, at the cathedral to have 
um, now a pair of microphones out in the room. And so I can actually, I have a set of headphones by the organ console and I can listen to what's happening in the room. So I can balance things very quickly um, on the spot. Um, but it is always important to have that uh, relationship between color and what the musical goal and effect is. And sometimes that means for the organ, you know, we, we have sounds that relate to vowel sounds on, of choirs, for example. And so depending on the section of music or what the conductor is trying to do with the choir, if the organist has chosen something that really stands away, I think that ha that is something that has to have uh, some discussion about. Um, but generally, I think good organists that understand choral singing and understand um, what the goal is for uh, musical texture, that that can be very uh, successful and uh, generally can be done ahead of time. But that's, of course, what rehearsal is for. So who are some of your favorite composers for the organ? Gosh, that's a really uh, tough question. As a youngster, I really, really was drawn to uh, French romantic music. And I remember when I started as an undergrad student here at U of H, in fact, I said, oh, I'm not really interested in the music of J.S. Bach. You know, it's not very good. And um, sort of a, a clueless youngster. Um, and it was all the more ironic because Robert Bates is, is world renowned as an early music specialist. Um, and so I, I didn't quite know what I had gotten myself into necessarily. Um, but boy, did I develop a love for early music through that. But specific composers, that's really hard for me to say. Um, for organ, my, I, I still think my favorite composer of all time is Mahler. I, as an orchestral musician, I um, just fell in love with the, the music of Mahler. Great choice. Yeah, and so I, I am drawn to more romantic music than early music, probably, to be fair. Um, but currently, um, the composers that I've worked with on commissions have all been really fantastic. And I've got a new piece that uh, was just um, delivered uh, about a month ago uh, by a Canadian composer, Rochelle Loran, who's a really fantastic composer. And I'll be premiering this new work uh, on February 4th at Christchurch Cathedral in a recital. Uh, so I hope folks can uh, attend that recital. But the um, idea of working with composers who either have experience writing for the organ or composers who maybe don't and tr educating them about the organ, I think is really exciting. Look, Daryl, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you very much. And I've learned so much about the organ. Um, they are a fascinating instruments uh, and beautiful instruments. And, and, and I, I don't really think we know or we realize how much they bring to our lives because you walk out of church on a uh, on a Sunday morning and and you know you forget that there has been a, a great organist accompanying the hymns. Daryl Robinson, thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you to all who support the Houston Chamber Choir, our season underwriter, Silvercrest Asset Management Group, our patrons, donors, and subscribers. We appreciate all you do to help keep the work of the Houston Chamber Choir possible. I'm Sinjin Flynn, and this is Behind the Music. Join us again next time. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue making new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org slash give.